Okay, again, uh, welcome to all of you. Good morning to everybody in Canada and good evening to everybody in India. So this is an exploratory meeting. The main purpose actually is to identify common area for work and collaboration. And uh, that is the kind of agenda. There is a set of diverse topics on which both sides uh, speakers will talk about. And that is not the whole story. There are a lot many other things going on, which uh, we can read about and uh, discuss it uh, in more detail in future. So just to give a little bit of background, let me share a slide. So we officially launched an initiative on quantum technology last year. It has a long history. There was many things in the background for several years, but finally we made a official platform. It includes about 42 faculty members from 11 departments. The list is given here, but there are lots of acronyms. So let me just spell them out. Physics, high energy physics, center for nanoscience and engineering, electronics and systems, engineering, electrical communication engineering, mechanical engineering, instrumentation and applied physics, material research center, solid state and structural chemistry unit, computer science and automation, and uh, Center for Data Sciences and Systems. So this is a big variety. It's a kind of virtual platform involving all people and trying to bring them under a common interest and umbrella. And our first agenda uh, for the center is to learn how to make elementary components of quantum technology, learn how to make them and make them well and with good fidelity so that they can become part of whatever may come in the future. And that is where we have started. There is a master's program in quantum technology. It's a two years course based program which will start in August of this year. And we'll see how well things progress in the sense that we are generating funding from various sources, support from both government uh, departments as well as uh, some private groups and establishing collaborations with international institutions is also an important part of the program where we can learn new things and also contribute new things to whatever developments uh, that are happening worldwide. So that background, now I can uh, hand it over to Shushanta to describe what is uh, the view from his uh, side. Thank you so much, Apurva. Uh, so welcome again. Uh, good morning to our colleagues in Waterloo and good evening to our uh, friends and colleagues at uh, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Uh, as we have seen, the nanotechnology is really in forefront of uh, how things are changing our lives, uh, particularly in this case for COVID-19, which we are in the pandemic. We see that uh, nanoparticles are used for mRNA vaccine uh, productions and delivery similar to creating st stable qubits for quantum computing. And uh, we are quite fortunate at the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology, which is the building that you see here. It is located inside the uh, uh, Mike and Ophelia Lazaridis Quantum Nano Center. So we have uh, 
both the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology acronym WIN and the Institute for Quantum Computing, IQC, co-located in the same building in the background. I wish I could have invited all you all over to our beautiful campus, to our beautiful building, but having the uh, quantum and nano together creates a tremendous opportunity here and the uh, number of our colleagues that are joined in today's uh, uh, discussions and presentations are from uh, um, all the uh, both a member from WIN and IQC. So I think this is an exciting time. We would love to partner with India, with the Indian Institute of Science, a real powerhouse of science in India. And uh, as uh, towards the end of uh, tomorrow's uh, discussion at the closing time, we'll also uh, lay out a plan of uh, seed funding that will happen between uh, the WIN and ISC Bangalore to kickstart a few of these joint collaborative projects. With this, I want to end uh, this opening remarks sessions and uh, welcome everyone and look forward to an exciting sessions. Lisa, to you. Oh, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Lisa Pakryats. I'm the Assistant Director for Research Programs at the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology. Um, it will be my pleasure to be able to chair this session one uh, on quantum technology. First, what we'll do, um, I would like to share a few housekeeping items. So there we go. Are you able to see that? Okay, so um, for today and tomorrow's sessions, I just wanted to let you know all attendees, uh, we have you on mute, but unless you um, have been promoted to presenter mode, uh, please keep your camera off. Um, sometimes uh, somebody would uh, um, accidentally turn, turn the camera on and then that would uh, create a little bit of uh, technical issues. Uh, for attendees, when you have questions for speakers, if you um, have a question for the speaker, please wait until the speaker has completed their presentation. You can use the raise hand feature uh, to indicate that you have a question when the speaker has completed. Uh, then you'll be called on to ask your question where you'll be unmuted and then you can enable your camera. Uh, and then when your question has been answered, please close your camera and then uh, lower your hand. And then um, I will be timing all presenters when uh, you'll have about 20 minutes for your full um, uh, presentation and question and answer period. When you have uh, two minutes left in your presentation, I will raise a hand uh, very delicately to let you know. And uh, I could type in also how much time you have left. And then I wanted to give a special note. Um, several talks will be recorded for posting uh, online for a later date, just to make sure that you are aware of that. Okay, so now. Here we go. Um, I will turn off my camera. Um, and uh, it is my uh, pleasure to present or to uh, introduce our first presenter, Professor Vibor Singh from the Department of Physics at uh, the Indian Institute of Science at Bangalore. And his uh, title is Superconducting Hybrid Optomechanical Devices. Yeah, sorry about this. I uh, I went to full screen without realizing that I'm actually muted. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot, Lisa, for the kind introduction. Um, and thanks, Arindam and Prashant, for uh, giving this opportunity to present uh, you know, results from my lab uh, in this meeting. I'll be happy to explore uh, collaboration opportunities uh, with members present here. Uh, so before I begin, uh, let me thank the group members who actually do all the hard work and uh, you know, uh, I get the opportunity to, to present these results, but they are the real people who are doing all the hard work. Uh, I also have one of the colleague who is present in the audience who works on similar field, uh, some complementary aspects of uh, superconducting devices for quantum technology applications, Dr. Baladitya Suri. Uh, and uh, he's basically setting up his lab uh, and uh, in, is in the process of uh, getting results. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'll be focusing results uh, from my lab. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to tell here is about superconducting hybrid optomechanical devices. What these buzzwords are, I'll try to explain by taking two particular examples. Okay. So, you know, this is a very short talk, and I think I will finish it uh, within time. Uh, but so please feel free to interrupt me if there is any question. I'll be happy to answer in between. 
So let me begin by this uh, simple slide explaining uh, what circuit QED is. OK, so this is the electrical analog of uh, uh, cavity QED where an atom interacts with uh, electromagnetic excitation in an electromagnetic uh, cavities. So role of cavities is played by. Uh, I'm sorry, let me try to get the laser pointer here. So the role of uh, cavity is played by these LC circuits, uh, and the uh, role of atom is or at, uh, as atom is played by these uh, superconducting uh, qubits. Okay, electrical cavities are made by these inductors and capacitors, and uh, due to the symmetry uh, in charge and flux, you get when you quantize such an electrical circuit, you get these equally spaced energy levels. Qubits, on the other hand, due to nonlinearity of Josephson junctions, produce unequal uh, energy space, uh, energy spectrum. Okay, so if one restrict uh, uh, such an electrical circuit to first two energy levels, you can have uh, basically label them as ground in the excited state and effectively treat it as a two-level system. But it's good to keep in mind that you know most of the superconducting qubits that we deal with they are have multiple levels present. Okay. By coupling these uh, electrical circuits together through capacitor or inductors, you can have, uh, you know, you can have them coupled, and you can induce this uh, Rabi-type coupling between the excitation in the cavity and excitation in the qubit mode. These uh, electrical circuits, they are designed in few gigahertz frequency range, and uh, once they are cooled to very low temperature, something like 10 millikelvin, uh, they are initialized to their quantum ground state. Since they are made from superconductors, with some effort, it's uh, easy to get uh, quality factors up to the order of a million or so. Okay. So it's a fairly uh, well mature technology of uh, uh, where qubit interacts with the linear cavities and uh, has a lot of application towards quantum computing and uh, peripheral devices for computation. Fundamentally, if you think about uh, this platform here, the excitations are limited to electromagnetic modes. You take cavity or qubit, the excitations they live as you know in these bosonic or uh, these organic modes. Okay, so one question uh, what people try to uh, address is that is it possible to add new degrees of freedom in circuit QED platform and exploit some complementary properties for further advantage? Okay, so what I mean by that, I have tried to explain with these three examples. Uh, so take for example case of a qubit coupled to uh, you know spin excitation in a ferromagnetic insulators so under suitable magnetic field you can have excitation frequencies in gigahertz range okay and by having a qubit and these spin excitation known as magnons in the same frequency range one can have a coherent exchange of uh, excitation uh, quanta between qubit and uh, magnons okay so this is a field which is known as quantum magnonics Similarly, uh, there is a field which is dubbed as quantum acoustodynamics, where what you try to do is replace the role of photons by phonons, uh, which are present in terms of uh, standing waves on the surface of a piezoelectric substrate. Okay, so this middle cartoon, what you see here, there are two gratings here, and uh, you know by exciting them at some suitable frequency, uh, you can have a standing wave formed, and when quantized, this will act like a phonon. Okay, and one can due to this piezoelectric effect, one can couple a qubit with it, okay? So this is a field which is completely analogous to quantum electrodynamics, but here the role of electromagnetic excitation has been replaced by phonon. This third example here on this slide, which is cavity optomechanics. So these are low frequency fluctual uh, mechanical resonators, and uh, you know, uh, this is for example, a mechanically compliant capacitor plate, and is free to vibrate, so it can have frequency in the range of few megahertz. And due to low frequency, uh, the quality factors could be very high. Okay, so these systems are highly coherent, and one can ask the question: Can we integrate a superconducting qubit with these low frequency fluctual modes? Okay, and the general idea behind all these uh, different systems is to engineer large coupling strength while reducing the decoherence rates. Okay, so the figure of merit can be given in terms of: Are you winning in terms of coupling strength? And can you suppress the loss of information through incoherent channel? Okay. So focus of my group is on these low frequency oscillators, and uh, this I will try to illustrate by uh, two examples. Okay. A very uh, so the very first example is uh, 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 is on flux based coupling. 
so for example, consider, uh, you know, uh, if you want to consider the interaction of a mechanical mode to a microwave cavity, you, this is a very prototypical setup. Okay, so imagine you have a mechanically compliant capacitor, you shunt it with an inductor and form a microwave cavity. So you can choose the value of capacitor and inductor in a such a way that frequency is in the range of few gigahertz. Okay, since this plate can move, it will make the capacitance as a function of displacement or the separation between the two plates. So by the virtue of this movement, we have a parametric coupling between mechanical motion and the excitation in the cavity. Okay. And if you treat this uh, setup more carefully, you would see that the coupling between these two modes is radiation pressure like, which is the intensity which is given by A dagger A couples to displacement. Okay. And a figure of merit can be defined in terms of shift in cavity frequency due to zero point motion of the mechanical oscillator. Okay. So this is a very standard radiation pressure like coupling that one can implement in microwave domain. One question that we asked in our group uh, was, you know, uh, is it possible to, uh, uh, you know, use a separate degree, a second degree of freedom, which is inductor here, or put it differently, it's magnetic flux. Okay, so rather than having a mechanically compliant capacitor, can we have something which is like a displacement dependent inductor? Okay, so this is the question that we posed, and uh, would it be further possible to, you know, use this inductor? to have a CQD, to have it integrated in the circuit QVD platform. Okay, what I mean, can you design a qubit out of this inductor? Okay, so anyone who has worked with the magnetometers would know that, you know, uh, the answer goes in squid. Okay, so you take two Josephson junctions, uh, put them in a, you know, in a closed loop, and then you have a electrical element whose inductance depends on the magnetic flux threading that loop. Okay, so this is comes from the interference of superconducting phase across these Josephson junctions. Okay, the inductance can be given by this expression, and if you look at it, what we are dealing here is an extremely nonlinear dissipationless inductor where the inductance is also a periodic function of magnetic flux. Okay, so as one increases the magnetic flux, you see LJ value uh, goes up, and hence, if you try to make a resonant circuit using this element, the frequency will go down. Okay, so if you want to make a displacement dependent inductor, uh, you just make one of the arm of the squid loop suspended. Okay, so now what is going to happen? The displacement of this arm would change the magnetic flux threading this loop. And again, if you are designing the LC oscillator, you will have a parametric coupling between displacement and the cavity mode that you would synthesize. Okay, so this is the idea, uh, for example, to get a parametric coupling between mechanical oscillator and a qubit. Okay, so this is exactly what we do. Uh, so this is a device that we fabricate here at Center for Nanoscience. Uh, so what you see here on the screen, there are two junctions. These are like 100 nanometer by 200 nanometer uh, Josephson junctions. This is one, this is another one. And this has been put in a squid loop. Okay, there are other electrodes which are defining the capacitance and inductance that I'll show shortly. Uh, there is one electrode here that can be used to electrostatically actuate the nanowire that you see in the middle. Okay, so this ent entire structure is uh, free to uh, vibrate okay so if for example we apply magnetic field which is perpendicular to the squid plane uh, the mode which is in plane vibrating in plane uh, will modulate the, the frequency of the uh, circuit okay so that's the idea and this entire inductance is then suitably shunted with the capacitor and while doing so one has to keep in mind that you know you don't dilute the harmonicity and harmonicity much and keep sufficient in harmonicity so that this can be treated as a transmode qubit Okay, and then this entire structure is placed in a 3D cavity for the readout. And we have input and output ports and a port that can directly uh, actuate the mechanical oscillator. All right, so this is how the device look. Uh, this is before releasing the nanowire. So this is the squid loop that I showed you earlier in the previous image. This tiny electrode here is the capacitance necessary, which is here that's providing, making it a transmode qubit. And there are other electrodes for input and output of the signals to the device. Okay, so the very first thing that we do here uh, in such devices is to check for whether the qubit is working fine or not. Okay, so what we do is we send in some microwave through this input port and measure how much signal fractionally has come out from the other side. So we measure transmission uh, through the cavity as a function of magnetic flux, which is passing through this grid loop. Okay, so this is a typical uh, measurement result. What you see here on the screen, the horizontal axis is the magnetic flux in units of flux quanta. And vertical axis is the frequency of the signal that we are applying. Here, blue represent low transmission and red represent the high transmission. Okay, so near zero 
magnetic flux, we see the transmission near 6 gigahertz. That's the cavity mode. Okay? And the qubit mode is designed to be 8 gigahertz, so it lives somewhere up here. As we increase the magnetic flux, qubit start to become resonant with the readout cavity. And because of the engineered uh, strong coupling between the two modes, we see this uh, avoided crossing between the two modes. So this is the signature of strong coupling between qubit and the uh, microwave cavity. And because of the periodicity of uh, inductance, it goes to a minimum frequency at half flux quanta and then again go back. Okay, And this period repeats. If we continue to increase magnetic field or magnetic flux, this period will just continue to repeat. Uh, this pattern will continue to repeat itself. Okay, So we can apply a large number of flux quanta and uh, uh, see this pattern repeat itself. The advantage uh, that you get at large magnetic field is if you think about the coupling strength here, which I define as shift in cavity frequency due to zero point motion, uh, you would see that uh, in large, when you have large magnetic field applied or put it differently, large magnetic flux, flux applied, a small change in displacement would result in larger change in inductance. Okay, So we have a system where coupling strength would scale with how many flux are passing through the squid loop. So it scales with the magnetic field or put it differently with magnetic flux. So by applying more magnetic field, one can increase the coupling strength between mechanical oscillator and the qubit. OK, so this is the idea. So the, to detect mechanical motion, what we do uh, is we bias in high magnetic field and, you know, at the position where shift in the mode frequency is large. Uh, so somewhere where the slope of this curve is large. OK, so we inject the signal at that, that frequency and see, you know, how what phase noise uh, and measure the phase noise of the signal which is coming out from the cavity. OK, so that allows us to detect the thermal motion uh, of mechanical oscillators. So what you see here is the thermal mechanical motion at 20 millikelvin. Uh, and we can characterize the mechanical resonator very well from here. So it has a frequency of something like 6 and 6.5 megahertz and a lightning width of something like 6 hertz, giving us a million quality factor. OK. One advantage, uh, you know, we have uh, if we can see the thermal motion directly is that we can uh, really bench, uh, we can really calibrate the uh, coupling strength, okay, without much of a fitting parameters, uh, because you know the you know at what temperature this is thermalized, so that power is known uh, from equipartition theorem, so you can you know uh, further scale it and compute the coupling strength. So this is a measurement of coupling strength uh, extracted by measuring thermal motion at different applied magnetic flux. So as we increase the magnetic flux or magnetic field, we see that it linearly increases as expected from the formula, and we can achieve something like four kilohertz coupling strength. Okay, uh, it's kind of uh, you know. So you can ask like you know what does it mean to have four kilohertz uh, coupling strength here, right? So if you're not familiar with the numbers here, it's like uh, an order of magnitude. Uh, larger coupling than the usual capacity coupling scheme uh, that one can have, for example, these uh, drum shaped resonator. So by using the flux degree of freedom, we can increase the coupling by an order of magnitude. OK. Uh, this also has certain consequences. Uh, you know, for example, uh, this large coupling between qubit and the mechanical oscillator results into something uh, like a splitting of qubit spectrum. So the previous results that I showed you, they were taken here where the two modes were roughly resonant. OK, uh, but one can park the qubit far away by increasing the magnetic flux and measure the absorption spectrum of the qubit. OK, so as we measure the absorption spectrum of the qubit while increasing the electromechanical coupling strength, what we see is that the usual uh, Lorentzian shape absorption spectrum splits into two distinct peaks and in between there are multiple interference patterns. OK, so this is an effect which counts, you know, if you consider a qubit, which is uh, driven in both longitudinal and transverse direction. So there's a well-defined theory for it. And, uh, you know, theory can uh, nicely capture all these fringes that we have and splitting of qubit spectrum. So this large coupling that we achieve in our experiment is sort of a manifestation, uh, manifest itself in uh, uh, the splitting of absorption spectrum of the superconducting qubit. Okay, so this is one experiment uh, where we try to couple, uh, you know, a mechanical oscillator to a spin half or a qubit, and what we are looking further uh, in these type of experiment is that, you know, would it be possible to apply protocols from ion traps uh, uh, and perform sideband cooling? Uh, so can we reach a quantum ground state uh, for the mechanical oscillator using uh, the qubit as a bath? Okay, so. 
uh, the current experiment could not get there because uh, you know the qubit line width was high, but we are working on it and hopefully with some restructuring uh, of uh, uh, design parameters, we could get to the state where sideband cooling can be performed. Uh, let me take a second example since I have uh, five minutes more. Uh, so second example that we are uh, take uh, you know the second uh, system that we are working with uh, in my lab is these uh, drum shaped resonators so i introduced this uh, uh, slide uh, to give you an idea how to couple the mechanical oscillator to a microwave cavity uh, so question that we asked here that you know uh, these systems they have a decent dynamic range something like a million photon and can it be increased by using a 3d cavity OK, so we wanted to design a system where a 3D distributive electromagnetic mode is coupled to a lumped capacitor mode. OK, so there are several design parameters that one has to figure out how to do good microwave engineering to couple a lumped capacitor to a distributive mode. Uh, so this is a, a example of that. Uh, so these are the drum shape uh, uh, resonators we make. So this top plate is free to vibrate. And uh, this has a gap of something like 300 nanometer and a capacitance of 11 farad. This goes inside a cavity which is very small in size, something like seven millimeters, seven by seven by four. Uh, these are M3 screws here, just to give an idea about the length scale. And uh, this has a fundamental mode frequency of 30 gigahertz. When you put this capacitor at the center of it, the cavity frequency is pulled down nearly to six gigahertz. So because of capacitive loading. The entire assembly goes inside a dilution fridge, and uh, we try to again characterize the coupling strength between uh, mechanical motion and this linear cavity. So unlike the previous case where we were considering mechanical mode coupled to a qubit, here we are dealing with directly with a linear cavity. Okay, so the first measurement we do is called optomechanical induced absorption. So you send in uh, two pulses, one at cavity frequency, another is detuned at one of the sideband and measure something like this. So what happens during this interaction, uh, you know, this is the usual cavity envelope that is that one is supposed to see, but it, in between it gets an absorption window. And what is happening at this particular frequency is that uh, excitation from cavity and excitation between cavity and mechanical oscillator, they are concurrently exchanging uh, with each other, okay? Uh, so this is a usual beam splitter-like interaction that we'll have between these two modes. Uh, so one of the questions that we are asking here is that, you know, in such experiments, uh, you can uh, push the coupling rate to something like five megahertz. And, uh, uh, you know, can we use, uh, rather than using an empty cavity, like a vacuum state here to cool the mechanical oscillator, can we rather create non-classical state in the cavity? So that schematically, it would be something like this, that this is the setup we have where we can control the coupling strength between cavity and mechanical oscillator. But can we engineer, for example, a single phonon state in the cavity by coupling it to a superconducting qubit? Okay, so you can take a single excitation, put it in the cavity, and then transfer it to mechanical oscillator. Given the you know rethermalization time of mechanical oscillator is much larger, you know it could be orders millisecond. Uh, you can have that single excitation stored in mechanical oscillator and bring it back to cavity later for retrieval. Okay, so this is a, a hybrid system that we are uh, slowly uh, uh, building. Uh, one of the challenges in uh, such experiment is, of course, uh, that you know, uh, to achieve large coupling, you have to parametrically drive the system uh, with strong microwave tone, which is not very good for you know keeping qubit in the ground state. So one question that we asked recently is that, okay, if you want to design this uh, 3D cavity and based uh, hybrid device and want to put a mechanical oscillator and a qubit together, uh, Let's put a lot of power in the cavity and ask the question how much time it takes for the qubit to relax back to ground state. Okay, so this again, we have to kind of figure out several uh, microwave ideas here, design the qubit in slightly different way as compared to standard transforms, which are, which are you know, where the junction sit at the center of the cavity. Uh, here we try to introduce a fast flux line in the cavity itself. So this is a schematic and this is an image of a real device. This is the squid loop, which we can use to tune the qubit frequency in C2 at a very fast time scale of the order of nanosecond. Okay, so then we kind of do usual experiment. We flood the cavity with lots of photons, uh, and then after a certain delay time, perform some control and uh, measure balls, like the standard uh, Ravi uh, oscillation measurement, okay? So when you flood the cavity with lots of photons and without any delay, you try to perform a uh, Rabi oscillation, we see nothing, right? Because qubit is excited to some very high energy level and there's no coherence present uh, in this mode, okay? But if, as we increase the delay time, 
we see that you know these oscillations they slowly build up and roughly around 8.8 .8 microsecond the contrast of these oscillation matches with in the uh, for the case when pump was actually off so by systematically performing this uh, you know uh, contrast measurement as a function of delay we get some idea about this resurgence time uh, how much time it takes for the qubit to relax from some higher energy levels and come to ground state so that comes around something like 8 microsecond uh, given the rethermalization times of order millisecond, it's still useful that you know one can hope to carry out those protocols to uh, uh, create known classical state in mechanical oscillator. Okay, so this is my last slide. So I will stop here. This is the summary slide. So I hope I tried to give you some idea uh, uh, about the research that we do in my group. Uh, it's related to superconducting hybrid devices. This is one of the project areas that we are currently working on. Uh, with two examples, one is uh, flux-based coupling between a transmon qubit and a mechanical resonator. And if you think about it, it's really a solid-state implementation of a trapped ion system. So we are hoping that you know by cooling the mechanical oscillator to ground state, it will give us more freedom in using this additional degree of freedom of sin half. The second system that we are trying to develop is this uh, cavity-mediated coupling between a drumhead resonator and a superconducting qubit. And we want to have control over both the uh, coupling uh, in time domain between cavity and qubit as well as uh, cavity and mechanical oscillator. So I'll stop here. Uh, time is up and I'll be happy to take questions. If, uh, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Professor Singh. Um, I will quickly scroll to see if there, there are any hands up. Does anybody have any questions for Professor Singh? Okay, I'm looking. I'm looking. I think, well, I think in the interest of time, what we'll do is uh, we'll go on to the next uh, participant, uh, our, our next uh, presenter. And if anybody has any questions for Professor Singh, um, put them in the chat and then we can continue uh, discussion at the end of the um, uh, today's session. So I will thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So uh, next, I would like to introduce Professor Na Young Kim from uh, the University of Waterloo, Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology and Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, the title of her talk is Solid State Quantum Simulators Block Exciton, Exciton Polaritons. Hello, everyone. Good, good morning and good evening in India. Can you actually hear me well? And I think I turn on my video, so I hope you can see my slide and you can see me and also you can hear me. I, I can see you and hear you and your slides. <laughs> You're great, awesome, thank you. So it is a great opportunity to share um, our stories uh, in Waterloo. So before I begin, uh, begin the main topic, I'd like to introduce uh, our uh, laboratory, we call Quantum Innovation Laboratory. I joined IQC in about five years ago, and this is just snapshot of our experimental uh, facilities and also the group members. And I have three main research topics in this particular um, today. I'm going to just focus on the solid state quantum simulators. So basically our driving questions are, what is a simulator and when and where do we perform the simulations? So this is the very common and as a classical example we can think of is, so this image is, is the old pilot pro, uh, programs to train the, uh, pilot, uh, train the pilots, but now you can also um, experience a virtual reality, the flight simulators, as you see that. The similar manner in quantum simulators, so we like to address some of the basic and fundamental questions in variety of the uh, different contexts, so that these are just a small snapshots. So by understanding, by building the quantum simulator so that we are able to uh, enhance our uh, our knowledge and also the uh, we can just move forward to the application side so this is a driving force so as you see that this bottom images is you are interested in some kind of black hole physics in the astros or even you can consider like quantum chronodynamics in the real inside of the atoms 
but you'd like to uh, understand what kind of materials could be the next materials. So the quantum materials are the important aspects or important targets of the quantum simulators, uh, chemistries as well. And uh, now people are also considering the intelligence, artificial intelligence in quantum simulators. So uh, the language of the quantum simulators, so what I mean by that here is a designated quantum hardware and we can construct a controllable quantum systems where we can mimic the quantum problems, just like the examples I show in the bottom. Particularly, we are fascinated by materials. Our groups are working on the solid state materials, and these are the, some of the materials I have been working for the last 20 years. And particularly, in the, um, if I highlight it, it's we are interested in the semiconductors like carbon, and this particular talk is related to barium arsenide and aluminiums and so on. And but when we divide, when we create the devices or systems, the semiconductors uh, um, themselves are not fully sufficient. So we usually combine with the metals or oxides so that, that we can build up the functional devices and systems. So in this context, I like to mention our current group members and old members as well, who've been involved in, in the solid state quantum simulator. So particularly I'd like to emphasize is that um, our purpose of the current research topics, uh, research target of the solid state quantum simulator is we like to engineer a Hamiltonian so that when Hamiltonian is understand, understood, then they from the solution of the Hamiltonian can in larger knowledge so that the, we can understand or we can search for the quantum material. So that's kind of the motivation of this uh, research topics. And this particular project actually I been st uh, starting like about more than 15 years ago, uh, starting from my the postdoctoral scholars at uh, Stanford. And these are the old collaborators uh, in the University of Wolfsburg who provide the samples. And I have some theoretical old collaborators. So since we like to understand the, what kind of materials, and especially solid state materials, I just breaking down how to understand that. And obviously solid state materials, we can understand their properties by the electrons, so that the particles, what you see is the atom, but the atom has a full of different electrons. And each electron can also exhibit like different orbitals, as you see this, the uh, S orbitals and P orbitals and D orbitals. The hybridization of these orbitals and spin diverger freedom, as well as the interaction that actually gives the uh, amazing properties. In particular, these electrons in solid state uh, systems can form the crystal structures of lattices. So this is just the uh, prime examples of the graphene, which is the really active materials on the left. And then on the right is the uh, schematic of the copper oxide. This the uh, square lattice of the hybridized oxygen and uh, copper that will be considered to be responsible for the high temperature superconductivity. So we'd like to understand the uh, manifesting microscopic properties. We uh, see how electrons are behaving in this crystal structure. So that's a typical solid state system in order to characterize those the, uh, properties. And these two snapshots are experimental tools to extract their um, behaviors. On the left, this is the energy versus the high um, energy versus the momentum. So what you see is in fact the band structure. So from the band structure, we are able to see what kind of energy states are available and what kind of wave number or the momentum uh, is allowed. So this is an important understanding of the material is pretty much the first thing you want to do in the momentum space or the kx and ky and kz it depends on the your material of the dimension on the right what you see is a snapshot of the scanning electromagnet um, the micros microscopy which shows the real space electron distribution so by looking at that how electrons are configured in the real space so these are typical way to 
understand or they extract this, the electronic chemical uh, properties in solid state system or condensed matter system. So as a simulator, we like to feel like mimic this the real material so that I'm going to introduce our material, our particle, extemplaritons. As you see, this extemplariton particularly resides in a monolithically grown the fabric para cavity uh, where we apply, uh, we uh, embed the quantum well, which is the matter part. And the exciton is a the primary quantum um, quanti uh, primary excitation particle, which can strongly couple to the photons. And then uh, by uh, in this is the, our platform like base. And from there, we engineer to form a exciton with the similar orbital state. So this is experimental result. So this is how we are mimicking of electrons in, in an atom. Now we artificially construct the lattices, the crystal structures. There are several different manners, and this is the mimicking of the, the real materials, the crystal structures, and now followed by the, our detection schemes. And as you see, because we have a, a direct analogy to construct the band structures like a photo emission a spectroscopy in condensed matter, and we are able to also measure the intensity profiles of the extemplaritons in the real space. But furthermore, in fact, we are able to get this the phase map by constructing the interferometer. So this is the basic ingredients of the quantum simulators based on extemplaritons. So before I move on, uh, I'd like to have a very just like one on one of a micro cavity extemplaritons. As you could see from the name of the polaritons, and I also briefly mentioned, is we are strongly coupled of the quantum well exciton and the cavity photons in this the, uh, the uh, growth technique, like kind of very high state of the art growth techniques. And by uh, designing of the quality factor of the cavity photons and the quantum well, so that they are strongly coupled. And now what happened is we are seeing this, the duality of the particle waves. So these two particles are strongly coupled. And I think it's the um, same thing as the previous cases. We anti-cross so that the new quasi-particle emer emerges. That's what we call the extemplaritons. And these are the linear superposition of the exciton and uh, photon so that they actually inherit this the duality of particle and waves. And one thing I just like I briefly mentioned is this extemplaritons are bosons so that, that we can also study the quantum statistical properties of the Bose-Einstein condensations and so on. One advantage of the extemplariton cases, we have a cavity, as you see, and the, the dynamics of the microcavity extemplaritons in this quantum wells actually leak through the one of the uh, frag mirror, and this leaked photon actually can bring the all one-on-one -on -one information of the extemplaritons, for example, energy, momentum, spin and so on so that we can easily capture this leaked photon so that the, we can directly access the um, amazing quantitative information so this is just kind of snapshot in addition we are per, uh, performing this free optics so that the, we can access not only the real space how electrons uh, extemplaritons are distributed but also we can convert it to the momentum space. Basically, we can construct this the, um, the band structure. So, so that's what you, what you see here is that, that this is the band, uh, band uh, diagram or band structure or dispersion. People will say this is energy and then the momentum. And because of the strong couple cases, you see these two modes are anti-cross and the amount of the uh, anti-crossing could tell us how strong this the cavity photons and excitons are 
coupled. If some of you are maybe uh, wonder what kind of interaction in this case exciton is, as you see, is the dipole. So that um, this dipole can interact with this the electromagnetic field so that this, this is the uh, origin of the strong couple. And as also I mentioned that this exciton platons are bosons so that the, when you actually pump or create it, the exciton platons, this is in fact the same language of the, you can bring down the temperature. Then what you see here is that, that there's a macroscopic population the, condensed in the very narrow uh, the momentum or that kind of momentum uh, near to the zero. So that this is the one example of the Bose-Einstein statistics of the exciton platons. So this exciton platons uh, possess the amazing properties and to give us the opportunity to understand that not only just fundamental aspects of the um, Bose-Einstein uh, nature, but also we are able to design quantum simulators and other interesting devices as well. And in this particular case, is so now we want to create like kind of artificial lattices, uh, but I call it as a dimensional engineering. And as you could imagine that the, we have a two components, excitons and photons, so that the, basically we have a two knobs to control either exciton and photon. So that this, the zero D is, uh, it's kind of the bottom, you can imagine it's a bottom up approach so that, that you can create the zero D. So this is just a, four different methods to create a kind of the artificial quantum dot in the exciton platons. And the next one is we just moving up is uh, making a 1D. So again, like there are several different uh, methods we do. So the early work uh, I was involved with uh, patterning of the metal film and basically we control this uh, refractive um, the reflections components so that the, by squeezing the electromagnetic fields to have a, um, the, to create this the implant potential. Or you could etch like kind of the horizontal line so that the, it will perform as a 1D. And a few years ago, we also started because as you can see, the, this metal film deposition or this etching technique can only allow us to have just the one shot experiments because the, uh, we can really dynamically control so that the, we also develop like how we can create this dynamical control because it's also um, it overlap with the previous um, speaker as well. So the, by uh, Gary Marson is basically a piezo electric material so that the, we can actually launch the surface acoustic waves to uh, create the artificial lattices. But this can be actually uh, moves to the not only just 1D, but also 2D as well. And in 2D cases, uh, you, as you see, because this is the, our old work that the metal film, and by utilizing semiconductor the nanofabrication techniques, so we have a design flexibility. So this particular case is so we can create the Kakomet lattices, but you can imagine this is the, the leap lattices that any other kind of quasi uh, crystals we may be able to make. But then this design parameters, uh, we like to have some collaborations to give us the uh, very nice, the, the exotic uh, lattices we can maybe uh, target that would be the one of the next goals. So uh, we are happy to discuss more if uh, there is some interest in your uh, in your institute. And as all uh, as you see, because this the collaboration of the German group and um, the UK, they are actually forming the square lattice by launching this the two surface acoustic waves, and then they uh, are able to see some kind of dynamical controls of the exciton polaritons. And the bottom uh, right cases, this is amazingly nice. Um, the lattice is, is formed, and this is solely by controlling the laser profile, which is the recently done uh, in the, again, that kind of other group of the U in UK. And this particular talk I'm actually working on, uh, I'm going to show you in this case is, so what you see here is that we grow the bottom DBR or like kind of mirror, and then uh, we grow the quantum well, and then we interrupt this, the uh, growth process in the molecular beam epitaxy, and then we etched this the cavity. Um, the layer such that we are able to create the in-plane potential. So in other words, we can create this the artificial each quantum dot and then make a raise like kind of different geometries. So 
And then like kind of after those, the process is done and I put it back to the MBE and then regrow. So often we call this the etching overgrowth technique, which uh, is involved with the very sophisticated, like kind of heavy, the, um, the expertise in the MBE. So currently the only experts people can do in the world is in uh, Germany and the, um, the Switzerland. Okay. So it's a showcase for this. Uh, I'm going to just show you this, the honeycomb lattices. So the success, success of the quantum simulator is basically how you can control your the your simulating system, right? So they have, so in this case, that what can be controlled, what can be engineered, and how we can see that. So on the left is the design of the honeycomb. So we are in the uh, basically two-dimensional system. And what we change is, so we fix this a diameter. So each diameter acting like kind of each site, and we fi uh, fixed as a two micron. What we vary is this the dot to dot distance, uh, nearest neighbor distance, which we, which I denoted as a D uh, from three, four, five, seven. Another uh, parameter uh, delta I didn't uh, kind of spend a lot of time to introduce. As I said, external polariton consists of the two components, excitons and photons, but we are able to control the fraction of it, more exciton light, more photon light. So that those, the fraction is parameterized as the delta, which we call the detuning. So negative detuning is more photon-like, so that it's a freely moving. And if it's a positive, it's more like exciton-like, because exciton is heavier, much heavier than photon. So, but then it actually gives the interaction. So that is another control parameter. So that this delta detuning gives the exactly we can extract this, the photon fraction. Obviously, once you know the fra uh, photon fraction, you can also uh, know the exon fraction because the sums to be 100%. And as I briefly mentioned this, the particular etching growth, overgrowth technique gives forming the photon lattice. What does that mean is by changing the cavity layer, layer does not affect the exciton so that you could only affect the ex uh, photons. Therefore, if you have a different detuning, in other words, if you have a different photonic fraction, then you can also consequently change this the potential height. Obviously, you have a larger photonic potential, you have a much bigger, stronger potential you'll see. So this is our engineering uh, parameters. And then this is just a very representative of the photoluminescence spectra. What you're going to see is the energy um, so this is a kind of big tomography, but then each energy slice on the left, you'll see what is the distribution of Kx and Ky, and uh, on the right is Xy. Yeah, so this is by constructing this, we are seeing the experiments and then we um, uh, create this the theoretical uh, plot. So you'll see the very uh, good resemblance. So as I said, this is Hamiltonian engineering. So we vary this the uh, the d from this the uh, section and the delta, and we are extracting right now is the hopping integral t, and then uh, we develop this the self energy analysis try to identify u. So because of lack of time, I'll just like skip this and go to the final slide. So that this is just snapshot. What I show is we are able to build like block with uh, extemplaritons. What I mean by that extemplaritons exhibit in the crystal structures to have a block uh, nature. And we are currently identifying qu or quantifying this hopping integral T and then hopefully the U from the self energy analysis. And now we also see this the how condensation effect in this the context and how we understand that. So lastly, I just like end with this collaboration opportunities. And what we are interested in is given our the quantum simulator ingredients, what kind of Hamiltonians we are able to study in the interplay of the spin interaction orbital symmetry and geometries. And we'd like to also construct the 
theoretically the venue functions to quantify the condensed matter properties and we are also interested in the correlation so we are really open to have any feedbacks and comments and also the collaborations thank you for your attention Oh, thank you very much, No Young. That was uh, very informative. I think we have one question. Um, Arind Arindim Ghosh, uh, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Well, it's 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 very exciting talk. I have a couple of small questions. Uh, first is, uh, what's the size of the lattice one is talking about here? Um, because yeah, at the end of the day, it's a finite system. I'm guessing, right? So. Um, what's in total size is first question. Then the second question is, um, since it's gallium arsenide, one would probably expect uh, other higher order um, excitations as well, like trions, the so negatively charged trions. So how do they affect uh, your uh, experimental results? Right, so uh, it was a wonderful question. So first of all, you asked that how many lattices are included, so that in this cases, we are about 100 microns. So you can imagine my uh, side to side distance is about three micron to seven micron. So often, I don't remember like exactly so, but then depends on those sizes, we are easily cover like 30 by 30. And so that the engineering wise, we can make a, you know, 100, a, micron 200 micron and the access is now is a limited by our laser spot size and right now we are just also uh, make a larger spot size of 100 micron so it's a, if my memory is correct then 30 by 30 is um, very common like 20 by 60 we can also access so that's the size of that and obviously we can go actually be smaller than that, um, that what i mean by the smaller is the lattice distance 100 micron like 100 nanometers we can do, then we can jam packed up. The reason we chose this a few micron is that we want to actually examine this, the real space. Then like in order to see the real space, it's a diffraction limiter, so that the, uh, this the typical wavelength is about 700, like 780 nanometers, so that the two micron is good, so that we want to see how. But then if we understand fully, then like we can just um, small, then it's 100 by 100, is easily we can do that. Um, but Lisa, do you think I have time? Because uh, I, I could also uh, say try and so in this particular case is we are exciton, so it's a fully so that we have a, we the try and system. We haven't seen that. But in fact, we like to utilize a try and because a try and is not bosons, right? Because there's additional fermions so that the, I had a long time. Uh, has a dream that the, how we can utilize the triance. In fact, some of people put this electron, uh, two-dimensional electron gas system on top of the quantum well, so that the quantum well exciton is coupled to the electron to make a uh, trion and then do this kind of thing, which is a touch my time, uh, has a dream that the, how we can utilize the triance. In fact, some of people put this electron, uh, two-dimensional electron gas system on top of the quantum well, so that the quantum well exciton is coupled to the electron to make a uh, trion and then do this kind of thing, which is a touch imamoglu in the uh, ETH. And I, I love to develop that, but then I don't have good uh, theoretical <laughs> the colleagues and also the uh, growers who can actually do that. That's why we are halting. But yeah, you remind me of the, my old dream. So that was wonderful to further discuss. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Next question, Jadeep Basu. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Lisa. Uh, so very nice presentation. Uh, 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 so I had a couple of questions uh, uh, for Professor Kim, uh, which is, uh, first is, have you uh, looked at uh, the polarization aspects of uh, the exciton polaritons, uh, you know, that, that you have, you know, demonstrated here? Uh, that is the first question. And the second question is, uh, you know, these lattices, uh, have you explored their topological properties? That's a wonderful question as well. So that the this particular data set I show is uh, we are spinless or that polarization is integrated so that we haven't looked into that. We have a, a tons of data so that, that we analyze and then polarize so that, that we see the external polarity in this case because of the cavity so the t like transverse electric and tmos actually forms as sort of the um, 
the polarization, the splitting, so spin over splitting, so that people are examining of this polarization effect. And, and this work, we haven't, but we have the data so that the, we like, uh, we are currently understanding that. So somebody can maybe also help us to deepen what we see, because there's uh, the next part you also uh, dream. And so this is kind of snapshot of the kind of topological states we like to see. So the reason we are interested in the Kagome is definitely it's a flat bands and then how we can uh, consider this, the topological invariance or the berry curvatures and so on. So that the, this is also right now is in progress. We have a, some understanding, but it's not very solid so that I don't want to disclose in those cases. But if you are interested in that, I'm more than happy to have offline way to see like kind of the what topological invariance or the uh, symmetries and then the um, the, uh, the you know the berry coverages and so on. One another, another dream I like to have is can we actually build this anion in physics because it's a two dimensional system so that but again like as anion is quite mathematical and then that deeply uh, theoretical so we also like to uh, partnering with this the good theorist in that context. So thank you so much for all these things. I actually skip because of lack of time, but then that allows me to share the, some of the dreams we had. Thank you, Professor Kim. Interesting, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, I see no further questions uh, for now, Young. So we will move ahead with um, our third presenter, Professor Varun uh, Raghunathan from um, IISC, the Department of Chemical or Electrical Communication uh, Engineering with his talk title, Emerging Nonlinear Photonic Devices for Quantum Applications. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. I, I hope you are able to see my slides. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yes, thanks. We, we, we can see them and we can hear them. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to present uh, in this workshop. I'm going to talk about some of the work uh, we have been doing in the area of uh, nonlinear optics with potential applications in uh, quantum technologies. Uh, so before I dive into what I have planned for this talk, I'll just give a quick overview of the kind of projects we work on in my group. Uh, a lot of emphasis is on nonlinear optics and nonlinear optical microscopy. Uh, we fabricate uh, arrays of uh, dielectric nanostructures in the clean room. Uh, which have resonances and these are just surface relief features like gratings which which have very interesting resonances which we study for uh, field enhancement and using them for nonlinear optical enhancement. We also work on uh, nonlinear optical studies in uh, 2D materials uh, using various uh, microscopy and uh, nonlinear optical techniques and we are also interested in combining uh, 2D materials with some of these surface uh, gratings we fabricate. Uh, with the hope of further enhancing the nonlinearities from these 2D materials, while the uh, resonance structures just act like a passive uh, resonator which amplifies the, uh, the nonlinear signal. Other than that, we also work on uh, uh, nonlinear microscopy, uh, more targeted towards biological imaging, like collagen imaging, cancer cell imaging, and so on. We also work on indoor uh, visible light communication as a part of like it could be a potential access technology for a future uh, 5G or a 6G uh, technology. And also we have uh, started a project on quantum communication, trying to build uh, trans uh, transmitter receivers and also trying to integrate them on a chip. Right, so, for, so for today's uh, presentation, I'll just focus on the first three topics just because it's a lot more mature than the other, uh, other three. And uh, what is nonlinear optics? Most of you might already be familiar, but just a brief introduction. We study what happens to uh, how materials behave as you shine light of uh, strong optical intensity. And uh, the response of a medium is generally characterized by its polarization which can become nonlinear in the sense that it depends now on mixing of electric fields. And typically, for uh, example, if you are trying to build harmonic generators or, uh, for example, a green laser pointer would make use of a bulk nonlinear crystal with the second order nonlinear effect. And this has been used for uh, quantum optics applications as well to generate heralded photon pairs and so on. And uh, over the last 10 years, the trend has been to integrate such kind of crystals onto a uh, on-chip platform. For example, silicon and silicon nitride waveguides have been used and four-way mixing processes have been used to generate uh, heralded photon pairs. 
And what is the next in this kind of a scaling? So there is interest in making similar kind of structures in uh, surfaces, uh, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today, which uh, we call as resonant meta surfaces. And this is an example where people have looked at three, five resonant meta surfaces. And there's also interest in leveraging high nonlinear optical uh, properties or nonlinear optical coefficients of 2D materials and somehow integrating them with these kind of uh, resonant structures. So this, uh, this is what we see as uh, the, the next uh, major uh, thing which can happen in nonlinear optics in terms of miniaturizing your nonlinear media while at the same time not compromising on the actual efficiencies. So what is the, uh, the system we have in the lab to study all these things? We have, uh, so this is essentially what my students use day in and day out. Uh, so this is a nonlinear optical microscopy system uh, and we also do imaging. So that's the reason why we use high repetition rate light sources and uh, the kind of wavelengths which are accessible go from all the way from uh, uh, the near IR to mid IR. And there's also a pump laser, so one can potentially do two color experiments as well with this kind of uh, experimental setup. And uh, what are the different processes which we can study? And some of them can also be studied uh, simultaneously. We study multi-photon fluorescence processes or luminescence processes. We study harmonic generation, four-way mixing, and also we can study vibrational nonlinearities uh, such as uh, coherent Raman scattering and also stimulated Raman scattering type processes. So with that kind of quick introduction, I'll move on to some of the topics we have worked on over the last uh, few years. So these are some nanostructures we have built uh, or fabricated in the uh, in the sense uh, clean room facility in IASC. So these are arrays of silicon nano disks uh, on a glass substrate. And individually, each of these nano disks will support a characteristic me type resonance, which could, depending upon uh, the wavelength of excitation and scattering, they could be categorized into electric dipoles, magnetic dipoles, electric water poles, magnetic water poles, and so on. But then what happens when you arrange them into a closely packed array? A better way to describe these uh, kind of uh, resonances is based on guided mode type resonance effects where uh, light is guided into uh, an effective uh, waveguide media and then selectively coupled out at characteristic frequencies where they can uh, again constructively or destructively interfere with the specular reflection components creating very interesting resonance effects. So that's what we are also trying to leverage to create uh, resonant uh, metasurfaces. And uh, these are uh, a particular meta surface we design, uh, and uh, we intentionally make these resonances broad. So you can see that it uh, the full width half max is probably spanning about 50 to 60 nanometers here. The reason is that uh, our excitation light source is also broad, and we also excite across a wide uh, spectral window and also a large acceptance angle as well. So to accommodate for the large angles of incidence and the wide spectral coverage of a laser, we make uh, the resonances broader so that we can excite uh, these resonances more efficiently with the light sources we have. And uh, with these kind of structures, we have been able to look at uh, harmonic generation enhancement. And what you see here is a third harmonic generation enhancement study, which we did on these silicon nanostructures. And uh, we have achieved about uh, an efficiency enhancement of about 500 times. The conversion efficiencies are still on the lower side, so that is something where there is need for new nonlinear media, more efficient nonlinear media, uh, which can increase these efficiencies further and also to improve on the quality factor as well and how to further efficiently excite some of these uh, resonances. And our microscopy system also allows us to do spatial mapping of some of these samples. So what you see here is that we vary the intensity of light and we see these interesting patterns, right? At low intensities, it's the nano disks which light up. And as I increase the intensity, it's really the outside regions which tend to light up. So the contrast gets inverted. Why does this occur? Because it's like uh, the sil silicon uh, nanostructures are somehow saturating in terms of their nonlinear signal because of uh, this uh, multiphoton absorption and free carrier absorption type processes. And uh, the onset of them is very different as you excite the center of the pillar versus outside the pillar. Right. So what the nonlinear microscopy system allows us to do is to really understand how these saturation behaviors get started, where do they occur, and then how do they progress with increasing intensity. So you get a real spatial map of how things happen, how saturation occurs and so on. And the aim here is that can we use these kind of uh, intensity dependent uh, images to better engineer our nanostructures so that uh, the onset of saturation can be extended further to higher intensities and so on. 
The second topic I'm going to talk about are nonlinear optical studies in 2D materials. So there's been a lot of interest in studying nonlinear optics in 2D materials. First, for, as a way to characterize the nonlinear material, understand defects, understand orientations, and so on. But there is much more to this than just uh, using it as a characterization tool. Right? There are very specific valley selection rules which come to these uh, uh, these kind of 2D materials, which can be leveraged when we prepare our input states appropriately. Then we can have specific light emission from these structures, which could be made uh, polarization selective. And if I prepare a superposition of states at the input, one could think about generating entangled states by using these kind of processes. Right. So it's not only interesting from the basic uh, uh, properties or characterization point of view, but nonlinear effects can also be engineered in these structures by suitably designing your excitation and so on. So this is something we have been venturing for the last couple of years, where one of the materials of interest to us has been this multi-layer tin diselenide, which has been of interest to in the point of view of uh, having saturable absorbers for pulse shaping and so on. Our interest was to study some of the uh, parametric nonlinearities which uh, this material provides. And uh, we, we looked at various imaging modalities like optical images, AFM, and the forward and backward third harmonic. What was striking was that the third harmonic contrast looked very different in the forward and the backward directions, which, uh, which makes it interesting because uh, uh, something uh, something to do with how light interacts with the structure is different when light is emitting from the forward or the backward directions. And we also wanted to quantify how this nonlinear material behaves when compared to other popular media. And we noticed that these are in fact uh, very strong nonlinear optical medias with uh, a nonlinearity which is 1500 times higher than a typical glass or an optical fiber which one would use for long haul communication. So it's it's very interesting from its nonlinear optical properties. It has very strong nonlinear effects as well. So uh, can we ex uh, can we understand some of these nonlinear optical effects better from uh, uh, from these kind of nonlinear media? So with that goal, we started looking at uh, how to model nonlinear effects in these uh, material systems. And one thing which is striking is that the refractive index of these layers, right? This could be just tens of nanometers, but the refractive index of this media is very high. Like it's about 3.5. And for some TMDCs, it's been reported as high as 4 or 4.5 as well. Uh, so you, one could expect a strong standing wave type pattern to be set up inside this uh, cavity. So you can think of it as a miniature cavity where there is a standing wave which is set up. So there are uh, fundamental fields or the pump fields which are propagating both in the forward and the backward directions, which need to be accounted for if you want to model the nonlinear signal generation. So that's what we have done in detail. So I'm not going to go over all these equations, but then the final result is that once you account for the standing wave effects which are set up inside the small cavity, and at the same time take into account the absorption effects at the harmonic wavelength, and also the phase matching effects which can come in in the forward and the backward emission, then uh, we can explain what we are seeing as this uh, difference in contrast between the forward and the backward propagating THG. And um, uh, so, uh, so this this work essentially was a starting point for us to really uh, see that this kind of a thin layer, like tens of nanometer layer, can act like a very thin cavity. So the next task, what we are looking at currently, is that can we engineer these cavities further to enhance nonlinear optical effects and so on. So the last part of my talk, I'll talk uh, talk about the integration of uh, these two D materials with uh, the kind of resonant nanostructures I just showed at the beginning. So these are some of the previous work which people have reported, uh, where one of the striking things in these structures is that there is an interest to go for asymmetric cavities, like for example, 1D slots, which are etched in gold films or L-shaped cavities and so on. So these cavities are inherently polarization selective. Right? So what that means is that if you want to integrate a 2D material on top, you need to carefully align that 2D material to the, uh, the underlying structure. Otherwise, in the worst case, you could even quench the nonlinearity coming from this material. So how do you make it polarization independent is a question we were asking ourselves. Uh, so the first thing which will obviously come to mind is that don't go for asymmetric structures, go for symmetric structures and then arrange them in a 2D lattice. But then we soon realized that things are not that easy, that it's not just the individual unit cells which matter, but also the stacking or the, the how, how this lattice is arranged also plays a role. Whether you arrange them as a square or a hexagonal lattice also plays a role in uh, the kind of signal you measure and their polarization dependence. 
So we started venturing in this direction where we looked at these kind of hexagonal lattice, underlying lattice, and then we transferred a multi-layer gallium selenide, which is our nonlinear medium, to look at second-order nonlinear effects in this uh, work. And uh, we designed these cavities to have uh, a resonance in the telecom wavelengths where we had efficient excitation sources, and then tried to understand the polarization and the light emission properties. And, uh, and these are some examples of the structures we have fabricated and the transfer of these 2D material flakes on top of these uh, structures. And uh, then when we characterize these structures, we soon realized that uh, because of the underlying lattice arrangement being hexagonal, true polarization independence can be achieved only for the zero order diffracted SHG signal. So one has to restrict the collection angles in a way that you selectively collect only the zero order diffracted signals. And this is some polarization results we have obtained where, uh, where we look at on grating and off gratings or on metasurface and off metasurface. And we obtain very similar polarization dependence for that where we selectively co collect only the zero order diffracted angles. If we collect any higher order diffraction, then uh, we see that these plots uh, get distorted sufficiently or polarization dependence starts to set in. And we also characterize how much enhancement we can get in the nonlinear optical process. And we were able to observe about, uh, about a factor of 20 to 25 times enhancement uh, in the second harmonic generation process right on top of the, uh, the meta surface where you go away from the meta surface, the signals become very weak. Uh, that's all I have for this uh, talk. Uh, but I would, before I end, I would like to quickly point out two possible areas of collaboration uh, which would be of interest uh, to us. Uh, so we have developed very good expertise in nonlinear optical characterization and microscopy. So that is an area where if there are new materials which are coming in, you would, would like to understand these materials better, heterostructures and uh, individual materials. So that's something uh, of potential interest to us. And also to uh, explore novel architectures for these devices in terms of what kind of micro or nano cavities could help in enhancing the nonlinear processes would be of interest. And then taking this uh, further, how to explore the interesting selection rules which come in with these 2D materials and uh, the chiralities which could potentially come in with these meta surfaces. How can these be combined to, uh, to generate uh, quantum light sources, entangled photon pairs and so on would also be an area of interest. So with that, let me stop and thank you. And uh, uh, let me also acknowledge the people who do all the work, my students, and also the funding agencies and the collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that uh, very interesting talk as well. I would like to invite um, the pres uh, attendees uh, and audience to ask a question. We have a few minutes. Okay, no, actually, I'm not seeing any um, any urgent. What uh, we'll do, if uh, anybody has any questions, we can continue a discussion uh, at the end of today's session. Um, so next, um, Sir J.D. Basu from the Department of Physics at um, the Indian Institute of Science. And the title of his talk is Quantum Photonics with Plasmonic Cavity Coupled Quantum Dots, Single Photon to Collective and Long Range Emission. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and thank you um, to the organizers in, in, in Bangalore uh, and in, in Waterloo for uh, the opportunity to you know, share uh, some of the, the, the recent stuff uh, that we are um, doing here. Um, so what uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, here today is uh, essentially, um, uh, you know, three aspects of, yeah, so three aspects uh, of uh, uh, these, um, uh, the, the system that uh, uh, I'm going to describe uh, shortly, uh, uh, which involves uh, you know these uh, cavities, and I'm going to uh, uh, you know, discuss in, in a minute. But before I, 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 I come to that, let me just uh, thank uh, you know the the people who are involved. Uh, first of all, the funding agencies is Indo-US Science and Technology Forum, uh, because um, a large part of the work was done in collaboration with uh, you know different groups here. I mentioned here uh, in Argonne and in, in Northwestern. 
uh, as well as this uh, you know new sort of you know bilateral collaboration so this is something that you know as we are discussing a bilateral project this is something which is also uh, a useful thing to keep in mind so this is something which is started by the ministry of human resources uh, development mhrd something called spark um and uh, there uh, so uh, so basically uh, uh yes i was just mentioning that uh, you know the, there is this collaboration involved and uh, the work that i'm going to discuss here uh, was done essentially by the student who uh, just graduated uh, or just submitted his thesis uh, ravindra uh, yadav uh and uh, so basically these three aspects i'll try to uh, cover in in the next uh, 10 12 minutes or so uh you know so one uh, which involves essentially um, uh, uh, one part or at least the first uh, two parts here um involves uh, essentially using assemblies of uh, quantum emitters and these are essentially you know colloidal quantum dots and uh, i'm going to try to uh, discuss how uh, these assemblies uh, when they couple to these uh, cavity uh, arrays the plasmonic uh, nanoparticle arrays uh, what sort of properties emerge uh, because of this of this coupling and in the last part i'm going to talk about the other limit where basically now uh, we are down to uh, single quantum dots and uh, that also shows interesting uh, effect of the coupling uh, to uh, this material so uh, just a, a quick slide on 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 uh, you know what uh, you know in different groups uh, around the the world have shown uh, you know various uh, uh, phenomena uh, from from lasing uh, in what in in, in terry's group uh, to uh, more recently you know bose einstein condensation uh, using these uh, you know these lattice modes uh which uh, is published uh, in a group um uh, torma in, in in finland so there are various interesting properties which can emerge uh, due to the symmetry of of these lattices and uh, you know basically how you couple uh, emitters so mostly most of the studies uh, have focused on uh, using i mean basically tapping into the the uh, the spectral properties of of these uh, lattices uh, of these uh, photonic uh, arrays and 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 essentially uh, trying to use for example in most cases some dye molecules uh, which essentially displays the the mode structure so the spectral uh, properties of the mode so uh, what we uh, uh, used in in uh, in our case are uh, quantum dots so these are uh, essentially you know colloidal quantum dots and, and in more specifically what we have used are uh, you know this 2 uh, 6 cad uh, selenide uh, quantum dots or these are core shell quantum dots cad selenide zinc sulfide uh, and basically so so you can see here an scm image of of this so these are essentially uh, you know pillars of 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 silver and arranged uh, in this you know optical lattice and uh, you know these have this nice kind of dispersion uh, as you can see the typical you know sort of band structure uh, in in the in the optical uh, regime uh, and uh, if you look at the transmission uh, spectra so you can tune this uh, you know uh, extinction or 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 the transmission spectra of these uh, of this uh, arrays uh, by simply changing the dimensions of, of the lattice and uh, what you see here is is if you see this broad broad feature here uh, then that is something which comes from the individual uh, uh, you know metal cylinder so you have uh, silver here if you if you chose some other material this uh, you know would shift but what is, and this is very broad and this is typical this is typical of you know all this type of you know metal uh, particles and, and metallic nanostructures but what you see here is this extremely sharp Uh, you know resonance that you see which essentially comes from this uh, dispersion structure and that is something which you can actually engineer uh, by creating this these arrays uh, uh, out of these uh, metal nanostructures which by themselves are this broad uh, you know kind of uh, uh, transmittance but uh, when combined in this uh, lattice they show this extremely sharp and nano narrow uh, resonance 
uh, uh, lines and, and features, and you can tune the line width and the position by playing around with the parameters. The important thing is that these need to be uh, kind of diffractively coupled. So that's important that, that, that coupling is something which basically allows you to uh, see this mode or the appearance of this mode. Now, uh, we coupled this system. So in the first uh, uh, part of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the discussion uh, that I'm going to share here, uh, we looked at this, uh, this system um, whereby so you have this, this is an AFM of, 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 the, of the device. So the device uh, uh, you know, came from Terry's group. Uh, and then you know uh, all the subsequent uh, stuff that uh, we did uh, that I'm going to talk about here were done uh, in our lab, most of it, um, the experimental work. So then uh, you can take this and you can basically coat it with a single compact layer. So as you can see, a single compact layer of uh, you know these quantum dots. So very compact layer of this quantum dot, and you can vary the the, the concentrations, the density of this layer. Right, and so uh, essentially, then what you are looking at is um, you are looking at the emissions, so the photoluminescence from these quantum dots, the quantum dot layer, uh, uh, you know, concentrated layer uh, as they are on this template as shown in this schematic here. So now, uh, what you see, for example, if you are looking at uh, you know photoluminescence, uh, so initially when you when you just have this quantum dot layer, so that it gives a, a typical uh, photoluminescence, a broad peak as, as one would anticipate uh, for this uh, particular type of quantum dots. Uh, and then you, you start looking at the different concentrations. So what you see here are different concentrations of the quantum dot on these templates. And as you can see that as you start increasing the, the concentration of, of the quantum dot uh, layer on, 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 the, on this uh, one of these lattice template, then you start seeing this Kind of you know strong uh, splitting that you that that emerges, and when you plot it here as as shown here, uh, you see that it kind of shows this nice scaling uh, with the concentration, uh, and and kind of you know you can see that approximately it scales with the with the concentration, the square root of concentration essentially, right? So this is uh, a, a kind of a you know telltale it's one of the at least telltale signatures. Of, uh, of of strong coupling which emerges. So essentially, uh, you know, one is what one is seeing is that uh, the the excitons. So these uh, uh, quantum dots, uh, the excitons in these quantum dots, basically coupled to uh, these lattice modes uh, or the modes which are present in this uh, the templates and generate some sort of an exciton plasmon polariton, uh, and which is what basically uh, you know gives rise to to this feature. But what was uh, at the first part of the work, uh, what we observed is that if you go on increasing the concentration, then at an even higher concentration, you start seeing the emergence of an additional additional mode, right? So there is even a third uh, uh, mode which appears, and there has been some recent reports in, in literature uh, with a with a different different system uh, using a, a transition metal dye chalcogenide system. Uh, there are some reports. Uh, of the emergence of of, of this uh, sort of uh, additional um, uh, mode, which emerges apart from this, you know, the kind of well-known, uh, you know, upper and lower polaritonic features that uh, that one sees. So um, it turns out that uh, uh, when the when the with the simulations, so we ran some uh, simulations. Uh, this was done with the help of George Schatz and uh, his, his student and, and postdoc Charles and Mark. Um, when they did a detailed uh, simulation and looked at the spatial, um, so basically calculate the absorption spectra and look at, you know, basically, uh, you know, different uh, regions around uh, the structure, taking one typical kind of nanoparticle structure. So if you if you if you wish this region, when I'm when I'm doing the calculation somewhere here, assuming an emitter here, this is more or less like a, uh, you know, like a near field. So that's a near field region. But when you're looking at something here, for example, that's 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 kind of in the far field, and so what's uh, interesting, what what it seems to emerge from this, uh, to cut a long story short, is that this additional uh, mode, which also you know in the simulations uh, appears, so you can imagine this as an effective oscillator string, but this also represents the concentration. Uh, this uh, 
uh, more seems to be prevalent uh, more due to the coupling uh, to this long range mode so the, these these uh, lattice modes are uh, delocalized and i think uh, that coupling basically leads to the emergence of this feature so this is something which is purely there uh, for for the uh, in, in the presence of the lattice if you, if you if you just took that out and you just have an individual particle only focused on the near field then you would not see this feature at all right so so this is the first part in the second part uh, what i'm going to talk about uh, this is something that we uh, explored uh, with the, with the group in, in argon with uh, uh, mostly the theoretical work was done with stephen uh, and uh, some experiments uh, done uh, in, in, in the Center for nano, Nanoscale Materials with, with a group of uh, Gary Widerak. So what we, uh, so you see this feature, so I'm not kind of repeating this, uh, but what is uh, interesting is now, so this schematic uh, kind of uh, explains this behavior. So what you are looking at is you, are, you excite this, you know, the, the compact layer on the lattice in, in, in a particular region, right? And then you keep keep this excitation fixed, and you are now looking at basically uh, you know, probing. So you probe, uh, you know, uh, at at different distances away from the excitation region. Right. So normally, if if you just look at uh, you know, uh, 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 if you had only the laser, then of course you know once you go away from the laser spot, then you don't see, don't expect to see anything. If you have the uh, quantum dot and they are they are uncoupled, then of course you know it, it, it basically you see no intensity. Uh, as you go uh, a little bit away from this excitation spot, basically you don't expect to see anything. What was remarkable that in our case is that we found that uh, even if you go very, very far away from this uh, excitation region, you still see uh, evidence. So here, what I'm showing here is the spectra. So these are the spectra which are collected at, at different regions and it's kind of reversible. So if you excite here and collect here or excite here and collect here, the behavior is, is roughly similar, you see this strong splitting, which means that this polytonic modes actually are propagating far away from the excitation region. And uh, to extract and uh, quantify this, we extracted uh, a, a kind of a distance. So this is where the distance uh, up to which you are able to see the emission from the uh, quantum dots, although they are, they are excited at a, at a remote location. And what we, uh, observed, uh, interestingly, is if you look at this case, the, the red line here, this is the one with the highest concentration. Remember that this is a concentration dependent of strong coupling. Uh, the strong coupling you know, goes up to even uh, 100 MeV. Uh, and so if you increase the strong coupling, the, the, the length of this propagation actually uh, increases. So there is a, a scaling. So this is the lowest concentration. This intermediate one, this is the longer one. So basically, as you increase the concentration, you increase the uh, magnitude of the coupling, and you also increase the, the ability for these modes to propagate. So this is something, if you look at the scale, uh, this goes out almost all the way up to almost two millimeters. And this one here is going almost up to one, one millimeter. So, so this is really very, very long, long range up to which it, it, it propagates. And you can actually see even the spectral signature almost up to about a micron. Beyond that, it becomes difficult to resolve because of very low intensity. So this is uh, quite remarkable that uh, you know two features. One we talked about is the collective emission uh, mode that emerges, and the second is is very long range uh, uh, you know emission that you see far away from the excitation region, which you you would not expect to see if you just only had the quantum dot. So clearly the uh, the exciton polytons which are generated is actually uh, you know uh, allowing for the energy to be transferred over such large distances. And for the last part, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, coming to this quickly, uh, here we, as I said, we looked at the opposite limit, uh, which is you know single uh, quantum dot, right? Um, uh, but then there are, as, as the schematic shows here, you have isolated single quantum dot, but there are more than uh, you know one in the system. So there is a possibility that uh, you can. Um, uh, you, you you don't uh, you don't directly excite uh, more than one quantum dot necessarily, but it is it is possible that uh, you can find a quantum dot in the vicinity, which may be outside the excitation region. So um, what we uh, observe is 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 very interesting. So first of all, in this case, you do not see in the emission spectra is is clean as as you would expect 
for an uncoupled quantum dot. So there is no coupling, you know, because the coupling strength is very weak, um, and the concentration is, you know, very very low, much lower than what I discussed in the in the previous, uh, you know, two pieces of work. Uh, and so, you know, essentially, uh, you know, that is out of the picture. So spectrally, you basically do not see any signature of of any coupling, right? But when you look at now, uh, first of all, you look at the uh, second order autocorrelation function G2, and you see, you know, very very clear signature. So if you have isolated quantum dots, uh, the sign of a single photon is this is extremely low. So if you look at this 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 curve, I don't know whether you can see it. Unfortunately, I can't uh, zoom out uh, uh, more because. Yeah, so if you see this flat curve here uh, in green, basically it's almost immeasurable. So this is a very clear signature that these are single photons. When you put put this, uh, this is on 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 a, on a reference substrate uh, glass, for example. If you take the same quantum dots, they are on on this template. It increases slightly, but it still remains you know below 0.5, which is typical signature of you know the anti bunching and 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 the the presence of uh, a single photon. What is interesting is that when you look at the the lifetime, so you're you're shining light on on one quantum dot basically. So you're looking at the the uh, the uh, photoluminescence decay from single quantum dot. Uh, you see that this is for the quantum dot. So not surprisingly, you see a single relaxation. So it's a single relaxation function which typifies the lifetime, which is typically of the order of 20 to 24 nanos nanoseconds. You see a weak signature of a second kind of uh, a lifetime appearing. And if you look at the this one, this one here in particular, you see very very strong signature, both in terms of enhancement of the decay rate, but also a very strong signature of the uh, of the emergence of a second uh, contribution. And uh, no, so uh, I don't have time to probably explain uh, in details, but basically um, what uh, this uh, feature, uh, so this uh, we model with the help of uh, the group of Girisha Gurwal uh, uh, in Texas A and M. Uh, but if you do a detailed quantum mechanical model, because this is not captured by uh, classical uh, uh, models, uh, so you use a full quantum model using the uh, the entire Hamiltonian picture. Essentially, what uh, emerges is that you have a possibility of the lattice mediated excitation of a nearby quantum dot. So again, in this case. Uh, but this is very short range. This is we are not talking about you know micrometers, or hundreds of micrometers or millimeters, but short range. Uh, this is something that uh, emerges from this detailed analysis from the lifetime because you don't see any signature in the, in the spectral feature. But what is important is here we are talking about coupling by between two isolated quantum dots mediated by the lattice mode, and I think this um, kind of you know uh, has implications for uh, you know various aspects of you know, communication using you know, single photons. So I will basically end here by you know, summarizing what I just mentioned. Uh, that you know, hopefully we have been able to uh, demonstrate that you know how combining these uh, you know uh, two systems and creating these hybrid templates with uh, excitons uh, in quantum dots and and these you know uh, the different uh, you know photonic modes of this uh, you know plasmon based uh, cavity. Uh, can lead to uh, kind of you know novel modes emerging. Uh, it, it can give you very long range uh, transfer, and also in the in the last part, you know uh, some uh, idea about how even with single photons we could use this. Uh, this is still in a lot of work to be, to optimize this process, but uh, basically can be used to you know communicate between uh, different emitters, which is mediated uh, by. Uh, this lattice mode. So I will end here, and uh, you know I'll be happy to uh, take any questions uh, at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bazu. That was uh, um, a, a wonderful talk. I will invite um, our attendees to give uh, to offer any questions. Now we have a few minutes. Okay. I am not seeing any right now. So again, I will um, ask if anybody thinks of anything, uh, perhaps after this talk, or uh, you can um, uh, meet up uh, later on uh, individually. 
Um, and for our final presenter this morning or this evening um, will be uh, Pro Professor Zbig Wojlewski from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Waterloo with his talk, uh, Elucidating the Nature of Interfaces in Three Five Material Heterostructures. Take it away, Zbig. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I, let me just uh, switch, hopefully, successfully to the presentation. Um, so thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to present uh, um, you know, to a bit of an overview of our activities. Uh, uh, my goal here is to um, introduce uh, <clears throat> our lab and uh, then kind of walk you through the issues which are related to uh, optimizing the interfaces, which uh, as the things are shrinking, are playing increasing uh, role in the devices. Um, and uh, I'm going to focus on a simple, I, I hope you will find it simple, uh, experiment just to illustrate uh, uh, how you, we can get uh, insight with uh, a bit of a, um, I suppose, uh, not overly complicated uh, uh, techniques uh, uh, and, uh, and to show you the uh, path forward uh, uh, where we are going to uh, bring in a, a bit more of a um, powerful uh, techniques like uh, synchrotron um, uh, um, and, uh, and uh, mm, the double corrected uh, transmission electron microscopy. So the uh, the lab is uh, based uh, around uh, uh, our MBE system, uh, and uh, I'm not going to expand too much into it. Uh, the important thing is that we are focusing on, let's call them classical uh, MBE materials, uh, gallium arsenide, uh, uh, but also on antimonides. Uh, so um, the, we do have uh, X-ray uh, capabilities, uh, uh, in the lab, maybe I would just put this as a pointer here with the laser pointer is going to be probably a bit better visible. <clears throat> uh, so we do have uh, we do have our own uh, diffractometer and uh, a few other equipments just to help us uh, uh, with characterization, but we do rely a lot about the facilities in other labs uh, and collaborations. And um, uh, so this uh, is kind of an overview of what we're doing, and I as a little bit artificially divided it into the three sections, photonic, quantum, and, and growth uh, fundamentals. And uh, in photonics, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of activities we have in terahertz, um, uh, and that includes quantum cascade lasers, uh, quantum well infrared photodetectors, the man spectroscopy, uh, but we also have activities in mid infrared quantum cascade lasers, uh, which is kind of going to be a bit of a, a main theme here and um, and near infrared uh, in high efficiency transducers and we are now moving into plasmonics uh, um, uh, and uh, in, I'm not going to do the all the overview the, the, this is recorded so I hope you will have opportunity to just check it out uh, some um, um, references to the collaborations down here and uh, all that is supported with our growth fundamental study. So uh, even though uh, materials we are working in uh, have been around for a while, there's a lot yet to be done uh, to optimize them. Uh, in particular, uh, the antimonides are still uh, surprisingly fresh when it comes to understanding of what's happening at the, at the growth level and in particular, the, the interfaces. So uh, recently, we we uh, managed to demonstrate uh, what turned out to be a very substantial breakthrough in in the terahertz quantum cascade lasers, uh, and uh, uh, we uh, after a long stagnation in the field, you know, over seven years, we pushed it to 250k, which really brought the technique to. Um, uh, out of the laboratory uh, into a portable, you know, uh, uh, thermoelectric cooler based uh, system for, for even for imaging purposes. Now, one thing I uh, want to emphasize that the modeling which uh, led to this breakthrough at this point is based on uh, what I would call <clears throat> somewhat naive uh, picture of 
of those barriers and quantum worlds with uh, very sharp atomically flat interfaces. Uh, we, we do actually incorporate uh, uh, scattering at interfaces, but, but there's no, no interdiffusion involved. And uh, uh, we, we uh, thanks uh, in part to this breakthrough, we, we did get the, um, uh, the grant uh, uh, to carry on uh, this into the room temperature. And for that, it's pretty obvious that we also need to understand better the interfaces, how to optimize them, and how to model the devices, which is a more realistic uh, way. <clears throat> so the the uh, this is uh, this is a paper, a uh, fairly recent paper, where a, a group uh, from Germany looked at the uh, one of the Galli Marcinet uh, Algas quantum cascade lasers. Uh, and um, um, pointed out that, uh, uh, at least uh, from the point of view of the um, scanning transmission electron microscopy, uh, those interfaces, which are you know shown here in this dotted line, uh, are not really that abrupt, and uh, some of the barriers uh, are not even half the height of what he has been used for the calculations. So obviously. We do need to adjust for that when we optimize uh, the operation of those devices. Um, the situation is uh, even more uh, challenging when we move to uh, the antimonide based lasers in indium arsenide aluminum antimonide uh, uh, systems of uh, quantum cascade lasers. Uh, those are uh, very good systems for uh, meat infrared uh, applications. Um, some of the barriers in those structures are you know, nominally just three monolayers <clears throat> thick, so that uh, with the knowledge of all the issues uh, already in arsenides uh, uh, is uh, definitely illustrating the challenge. Uh, uh, at this point, the modeling again has been done in assuming those uh, very abrupt uh, uh, barriers and, um, and uh, interfaces. Uh, Okay, uh, so just a little bit of a dip into the 6.1 angstroms family of semiconductors. So these are not just uh, antimonides, but it's a nice uh, connection here between arsenides, indium arsenides, and, uh, and gallium antimonides, say, and you can have quite a few things made out of that um, uh, with higher high barriers with aluminum antimonides. So that's the, the ideal system for doing those uh, quantum cascade lasers in shorter wavelengths. Um, the, the system itself is um, extremely powerful and it's still uh, explored only a small fraction. Uh, we can have band alignments in every type from straddled to, to uh, staggered, uh, even to broken gap alignments. And we can, uh, we can do the, uh, the, the light sources, detectors uh, in the range from infrared to uh, to terahertz, uh, uh, the um, spintronics uh, applications and uh, and uh, uh, topological phases uh, for Majorana fermions. Uh, so those are all things which, in some way, we are uh, involved. Okay, uh, and uh, just an illustration of uh, uh, interesting interfaces in this material system. So this is just showing like a molecular beam epitaxial growth, aluminum and timonite. Then we grow in the marcenite. Everything seems to be nice and simple. But even if everything was that clean, um, the things to notice is that even though the materials here are relatively lattice much within 1%, the interfaces can be very straight. So uh, the, there is no way to go around that. Uh, your interfaces are going to, or the bonds of the interfaces are going to be either indium and timonite like or aluminum arsenate like. And uh, you can grow uh, different ways and you can, you can, you can have those interfaces uh, whichever way you like. And you can have a mixed interfaces which effectively are not going to be that strained, but the strain is considerable about uh, six, 7%. Uh, so those are either tensile or compressively strained interfaces. And this is just the beginning of the issues uh, with this material system when it comes to controlling the interfaces. Uh, so the uh, fairly recent work uh, has been done in, in a group in France, uh, looking at those interfaces uh, in the context of the quantum cascade lasers. <clears throat> and um, 
uh, they uh, this is uh, you know high resolution uh, scanning tunnel electromic uh, scanning transmission electromicroscopy uh, uh, where they were mapping the strains around the interfaces uh, and also trying to uh, to map the, uh, uh, the the atoms themselves uh, and the, uh, the the main conclusions they <clears throat> write that was that uh, the uh, indium arsenide um, um, aluminum and tinmonite uh, interface have mainly aluminum arsenide character unless some special precautions are taken and they attributed it to the aluminum arsenide bonds being much stronger than indium and tinmonite. Now, the problem with the TM, you know, we all love seeing the individual atoms or columns of them, but uh, by the time you make the sample, which are very thin, many things can happen. Uh, the, also, the, <clears throat> the, during the measurements, the, the electron beam damage can happen. Uh, the sample, because of all the strains, uh, you know, uh, elastically relaxes, so uh, things, the atoms expand. So basically, it, there's no certainty that what is being studied here is indeed uh, uh, what's happening in the bulk material <clears throat> and uh, uh, that uh, um, kind of prompted us to take a different approach and first of all see if we can uh, answer some of the questions uh, with those interfaces um, in, a, in a way which uh, doesn't need to go into very sophisticated techniques at this point. So, um, this is now <clears throat> a quick uh, MB primer. Uh, so this is uh, where the action is happening for us. Um, uh, we have this ultra high vacuum and we have uh, a fusion cells with ultra clean elements and we have shutters which can close uh, the beam off and, uh, and open them up so we can supply them on demand. And in principle, uh, those shutters work very well, um, uh, stopping the beams uh, almost instantaneously and uh, letting them in. However, one element, specifically arsenic, is not particularly keen to stick around and uh, they, they bounce and uh, even when you put the shutter in, uh, you are still having some arsenic behind, which, which creates uh, challenges to grow those very abrupt interfaces where you don't want arsenic uh, beyond indium arsenide. Uh, so the, we have uh, performed a two-stage experiment. One in situ, we were monitoring the, uh, what is really left uh, uh, from the arsenic flux after we close the shutter. Uh, so this is with the, uh, the shutter open arsenic, this is with closed, and then we were just monitoring the uh, presence of the uh, residual arsenic in the system. And, uh, and just uh, to illustrate uh, uh, this is the time uh, which it typically would take to grow one of the monolayers of aluminum and timonite. And you can see that we still have considerable amount of arsenic left uh, in the system, which can incorporate. Um, and, the, and then depending on whether uh, we also use other part of the arsenic cracker, which is the valve, we can stop the, you know, the, uh, the flux completely, but it just takes a bit of time to, to move this valve in and out. So if we um, if we close it completely, it's still sort of the case, but you know there's still a, a long uh, uh, presence of the arsenic there. And uh, so we know um, it, the flux of arsenic, uh, but we can't uh, uh, um, really uh, you know speculate how much of this will incorporate into the aluminium and timonite. Uh, and this is uh, because uh, um, the um, arsenic uh, is competing uh, uh, in displacing antimony from aluminum antimonide bond. And it's a pretty pretty complex battle there, uh, very much dependent on the growth conditions and how you do things. So we, we don't rely really on the, on the absolute values. We just take from this experiment the information that we have a constant flex of uh, bypassing arsenic, the, the shatter, and uh, we have some initial extra flux uh, during the first monolayer when we uh, analyze uh, our second part of the experiment, which is basically a growth of three layers, um, uh, uh, three structures, multi-layer, with uh, changing between aluminum antimonate and indium arsenide. Uh, those are 200 angstroms by 150 angstroms. And uh, we grew three identical structures. So 
even though this is a pretty busy drawing, just pay attention only to the gray parts here. So this is the effectively the 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 the, the valve opening. Uh, so normally everybody grows it with keeping the valve open because it takes time to close it. Uh, but we try it to have it partially closed and totally closed during the growth of uh, of the um, uh, aluminum antimonide layers. And uh, the design of the structure was made to make it particularly friendly for X-ray uh, characterization. Uh, so we did use our um, the diffractometer to run the uh, omega-2 theta scans um, and uh, uh, then performed the dynamic simulation fitting um, uh, to um, uh, simulate uh, the strain in the layers, uh, which would be induced by presence of arsenic at the interface and uh, uh, at, at, at in the aluminum antimonide itself. And uh, what we found was, uh, I would just focus only on the fully open and, and fully closed during aluminum antimonide for this brief discussion. What we found that indeed, um, uh, if we keep the arsenic valve open, uh, the interface monolayer, the interface between the um, indium arsenide and aluminum antimonide is 90% of aluminum arsenide bonds. Uh, however, and this is this was a new finding which somehow was disregarded so far, uh, that uh, the aluminum antimonide is no longer aluminum antimonide, but has up to 7% of arsenic in it. Uh, so, so that uh, uh, I, I, I should say goes beyond what has been uh, detected with the TEM. Uh, maybe it wasn't look really after. Uh, however, when we move uh, to fully closed valve, then we can indeed grow a pure uh, aluminum antimonide, uh, and we still have substantial uh, amount of arsenic uh, uh, at the interface, giving this uh, predominantly aluminum arsenide bonds, but already at uh, only 76 percent. And uh, so that really supports the uh, the idea that the aluminum arsenide, uh, uh, aluminum arsenic bonds is stronger than the antimonide, and it very likely is the reason behind. But uh, uh, for sure, the presence of the residual arsenic in the chamber is uh, also playing a very important role. So this is, uh, uh, you know, with with that technique, um, um, and you can consider the those uh, diffractive rams as you know Fourier transform of the actual structure uh, to to some degree and uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, angular range which we are looking at which is about you know not quite three degrees uh, will translate into our resolution uh, in in the real space of about 20 angstrom so this is really not looking at the monolayer like accuracy. Nevertheless, uh, you know, in combination with in-situ measurements I described, it does give us, uh, uh, I think, a fair view into where the arsenic is, but there are many other things happening at those interfaces. Uh, we already know that indium can segregate, meaning not stay exactly where you put it, so it can, it can walk out from the uh, uh, indium arsenide into aluminum antimonide. The antimony also is not to segregate. So the, the, the interface can become pretty complex. And uh, so what we are now uh, um, doing, we already uh, booked up the, the, uh, in July, at, uh, one week at the at our um, uh, Canadian uh, light source uh, synchrotron facility uh, to use uh, much better X-ray uh, um, lines uh, to 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 peer uh, deeper into the structures, including the resonance scattering, where we will be able to identify um, these positions of the you know in individual uh, species there. Uh, so th so this is basically our next step here. And the uh, uh, nice thing about the X-ray, it's non-destructive, uh, and uh, then we can use the same sample for doing this high-resolution uh, transmission electron microscopy at the Canadian Center for Electron Microscopy, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, going to elucidate how uh, um, the, those interfaces really look like, and hopefully we will be able to eliminate the uncertainty which are present uh, inherently with the TEM due to the sample preparation and also 
you know, just the energy of the electrons bumping in those uh, not so hard materials. So uh, the, that's uh, the outlook. Hopefully within the next year, we'll have some exciting results and, uh, and, and that uh, we do hope will open up a path to further optimization of interfaces and understanding uh, what's happening in this particular case of quantum cascade lasers, but it goes way beyond that. Um, so this is uh, pretty much all I wanted to share today here. I just would like to acknowledge uh, my group. Uh, uh, without uh, them, uh, I wouldn't have much to say here. Uh, and this, of course, is pre-COVID picture, actually shortly pre-COVID picture. Um, and hopefully we will not have to wait too long to make a new picture because we have new members in the group now. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it uh, from me. So thank you very much for your attention and I, I'm ready to, to take questions if there are any. Thank you. Oh, that's oh, great. That's big. Oops. Sounds like I have an echo. So I'll turn that off. Does anybody have any questions for Professor Vashlevsky? Oh. Well, again, I'm, I'm not seeing any, but uh, again, we can continue conversation later.